Welcome to another edition of Wellness Webinars, a series of 14 timely presentations on coping with quarantine and COVID-19, brought to you by Carolina Behavioral Health Alliance and Mood Treatment Center. Today's presenter is Dr. Chris Aiken, psychiatrist, Netflix or the news, staying informed while staying balanced. Dr. Aiken, the floor is yours. Hello and hello and welcome to another webinar sponsored by the Mood Treatment Center and Carolina Behavioral Health. We're going to talk today. Let me see if I'm camera. Let me get my camera on. Am I on now? Do you see me? It took it now it's there, I think. Okay, we're going to talk today about something we're all doing is using media from cell phones to Netflix to television and how it affects our mood and our mind. I need to click that little camera there. Okay. All right, I think you can see me now. And while you watch this webinar, you can slide your cell phone back and forth to see the slides or to see myself. You probably want to look at the slides. So the first thing we think about is how much TV or media use we're doing, including cell phone use, email, computers, Netflix, all of that. And are we doing too much? So what I'm going to be talking about today is that there's nothing wrong with using this stuff. It can actually be helpful to your mind and your mood. It's just the way we use it. So the first step would be to limit it, but how much should we limit it by? This is the latest survey on how much everyone is actually using media. It's 11 hours a day for adults, which seems unbelievable. That's almost every waking hour. If you sleep eight hours, that leaves you about five hours left of non-media time. So experts recommend about one to two hours a day of screen time, which is much different from what we're doing. And for social media, we have done studies where 30 minutes, if people just limit their social media time to 30 minute blocks a day, they have much better moods. But these numbers are gonna differ for everybody and it depends on what you're using it for, what good it's doing for you, and of course, what you're missing out on during the rest of the day. So my top advice for you would be that if you find there are important things in your life, like your family, your marriage, getting outdoors, exercising, or doing productive or other fun things that you're missing out on because of your media use, you ought to reconsider and try to reel it in. One therapy program for media addiction has people stop all of their screen time for 30 days, and then they slowly build it back in, figuring out how much is ideal for them. This reminds me of the Amish people in Pennsylvania. We often think of them as not using technology at all, but actually they do. The Amish prayerfully consider how each new invention is going to affect their lives, mostly from a spiritual and wellness perspective. And they just thought about it and figured out that computers are not going to help them and TV is not going to help them, so they didn't adopt it. But that's not entirely true. Some Amish people use computers and they intentionally buy the old 1980s IBMs with no internet connection. This Amish um, store owner figured out that that would give him more time to spend with his family because the computer allowed him to do his accounting faster. But if it wasn't connected to the internet, it wouldn't sap his time. So the next question besides how much are you doing it is what are you doing on the media? Ideally, you'd want to watch with intention. You could plan like watching the TV guide even and scheduling things anticipate the programs you want to watch. This is the opposite of channel surfing where you just flip around or these days the computer or TV will do that for you and think, what do you want to watch next? As I talk through this, I'm going to be giving you ideas that are the opposite of depression. So depression does not mean sadness. 
Depression means a lot of things. It mostly means low energy and low motivation and lack of will or intention. So if you ask someone with depression what they did all day, they might say nothing, when in reality they may have sat around and worried all day. If things, if they do say that something happened, they'll think of it as though something happened to them instead of they did something. So there's a great passivity to depression, and we want to avoid that as we use the media. It's fine to be passive for part of the day and just sit and do nothing, but less of that is going to help fight off depression. So if we choose what we want to watch and anticipate it, then we're acting with intention, which is the opposite of depression. The next tip is to limit the news you watch, especially the visual effects. We didn't fully know this until 9-11 when they recorded how much people watched the coverage of the falling of the towers and the entire trauma surrounding that, and they could correlate exactly how much time people watched with how much depression and post-traumatic stress they had. And it was like a straight line. The more they watched of those images, the more they got post-traumatic stress disorder. Before that, we thought that you had to actually witness a trauma, like see it face to face to develop post-traumatic stress disorder. But we now know that just watching it on the tube is enough to do it. And that's because the brain is a very visual thing. A big part of the brain called the amygdala is reading visual cues all day long, wondering if it's a threat and if it should be afraid of it. Part of the problem with depression and anxiety is it can make everything seem like a threat, and that's no way to live. Living with the feeling that there's a threat against you 24 seven is a sure cause of depression. So you don't want the news to do that. And most of the commercial news is designed to make you think that something terrible is going to happen and rile you up a bit so you keep watching it. Since it's the visual part of the news that has the biggest effect on the brain, you could easily cut down on that risk by using print media or reading it on your cell phone or podcast and audio media is not going to affect your brain as much as visual news. Here's one that a therapist recommended called Sunday Morning with Jane Pauley. And this particular program tries to bring uplifting news every week. It's a great source to balance out the rest of the news we're getting. The next ideal in your media use would be using it to create something or interact with other people in a positive way or learn something like we're doing right now instead of passively using it. Move around a bit, stretch while you watch the TV, or use the commercial breaks as an opportunity to stand up, move around, and stretch. There's a lot of research showing that the more TV people watch, the more depressed they get. But of course, some of that has to do with the fact that they're just sitting there. So the more people sit around, the more depressed they get. Exercise, I don't even really call it exercise, it's just, light aerobics like walking briskly, a fast walk, is enough to treat depression because it pumps up brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF, which makes brain cells grow and strengthen so you're less depressed. Laughter also helps. Comedies are clearly a good way to lift your mood, and you actually burn calories just by laughter. It's a slightly aerobic exercise in itself. I mentioned muting here, turning off the sound, the commercials, and there's a reason for that. It turns out that a big cause of depression with TV watching has to do with the amount of advertisements. Now, since I was young and I'm about 45 now, growing up through lots of changes in TV, it seems the advertisements have gotten more and they've gotten louder, and this is not helping our mood. So. Why is that? Well, take a look at this ad. It probably doesn't really make you feel good, right? We'll change it over to something a little more positive there. So advertising often works to create a feeling of anxiety in you. 
a feeling that you're not good enough, a feeling that danger might happen, a feeling that your life could be better if you buy that product. So it creates a bad feeling and then it puts forth a product that's the solution. Clearly, this is not gonna be helpful to our mental state. And I look at advertising as a salesperson coming to my door. I remember my great aunt had a policy. She would never let a salesperson in her house. She would just close the door on them. And I pretty much feel the same way. So why would I let a salesperson into my TV every 10 minutes while I'm watching it? There's a country called Bhutan, which is in Asia, and it's consistently ranked as one of the top 10 happiest countries in the world. So we can learn a lot from them. They actually measure their country's success not by the gross natural, natural product or the wealth and money, but by the gross national happiness index. So this country is intentionally trying to create happiness and they're not allowed to pass laws unless they can show that that law is gonna increase the happiness of the people. What a place. So in Bhutan, they have traditionally outlawed all advertising, all forms of it, because it just creates envy, anxiety, and depression. But Bhutan is changing and it's not as happy as it used to be. So it's, rates are falling down in the happiness ratings. And here's a little quote from one of the Bhutan scholars. He says that advertisements create desires which cannot be satisfied by your economic position. And the result is more crime and corruption as people want things they don't have and seek ways to get it. Another thing advertising does is create social comparisons. It's frequently putting forth someone who has a better car, a better house, or a more fit body, and saying, you can be like this person if you buy the product. Social comparisons in general cause depression. Now, our brains are designed to make comparisons. That's how we survive. We're constantly thinking, is this better than that? Should I do this or should I do that? And that's how our brain works all day. It works for most things, but it doesn't so much work for ourselves. We are not a product that we bought at Target and can take back if we don't like it. We have to accept ourselves fully and not keep comparing ourselves to others. So that natural comparing mind turns against us when we're always comparing ourselves to others, as advertising guides us to do and as social media guides us to do. So I'm gonna shift a little bit into social media. We find the same research results that the more social media people use, the more depressed they get. But there's little signs of hope in that research that it does indeed depend on how you're using it. That if you have what's called an unruly social media circle with lots of rudeness and insult, there's gonna be more depression. Clearly, if you're bullied on social media, there's going to be more depression. And if you're using social media to make comparisons all day, see if you get enough likes and look at other people's pages to see what their lives are like, that's going to create more depression. In contrast, if you're using social media to connect with people you care about, it's probably going to create less depression. Another one is reality TV. These shows are full of social comparisons. You might say that that's all that they're about is comparing people and at the end of each show, someone gets kicked off the island. Well, these shows engage us because that's a very basic primitive fear being kicked off the island. You know, a lot of our fears make sense. There are things like falling and being bitten by a snake, being kicked off an island. But what, what's so scary about being kicked off an island is that in the old days, by which I mean 2000 years ago, if you were ostracized, if you were kicked out of the tribe and made to live on your own in the wilderness, you would die. There was no way you could do that. We are a social creature because we survived socially as a group. 
protecting each other and serving different roles. So in a way, when I see people in my practice with social anxiety disorder, where they're really afraid of being rejected or um, kicked out by other people, I sympathize that that's really a fear of death that they're having. That's an extreme fear. As an aside, um, you know, we, a lot of us, myself included, do have a fear of heights and a fear of falling. It's really a fear of falling that you're going to fall and die. But I've never met anyone or heard about anyone having a fear of driving. But clearly, going 60 miles an hour is a lot more dangerous than standing on Pilot Mountain. And the reason for that is throughout our history as, as human beings, we were never exposed to situations where we went 60 miles an hour. So there was no need to evolve this fear of crashing or going too fast. But we were exposed to many situations where we might fall. Well, I'll stop talking about my own phobias and justifying them right now and onto a very common one, which is the fear of getting kicked off the island. So again, television often preys on and plays with our primitive basic fears and riles them up. This one is about being rejected, being isolated, and being not as good as others. That's what a lot of reality TV is, and that's probably why there are associations with watching more reality TV and having more depression. So what good can TV do? Well, for years I've been following this research and I didn't really see any good that TV can do until recently. And people started coming into my practice genuinely telling me that TV was helping their mood. Well, I'm kind of skeptical of this, but I took them at their word and I noticed a pattern there. They were watching programs without advertising. One man just really lit up. He had a, a smile on his face, which I'd never seen before in this person with chronic depression. And he told me his mood lifted when he watched Turner Classic Movies. Well, if you've seen these, they tend to have no advertisements. And think about it. Are you really going to compare yourself to the way that someone is in 1940 with their hat on and their gray suit and their antique car? You're not going to be thinking, they have a better car than me or they have a better suit than me because it's such a different world. Same thing probably for fantasy and science fiction movies. There's a little less social comparison that goes on in those genres. But the main reason I think that people are finding TV helpful to their mood these days is that they can genuinely get absorbed in the programs. This first started to happen with The Sopranos when HBO realized they had advertising free TV. So they could create hour-long programs that were rich and detailed with complex characters that people could really get into and lose themselves for an hour as they watched the whole thing. Uh, of course, as many programs have built since then, and it's created a whole genre of advertising-free programs. When there isn't advertising, it's not just that there's a lack of salespeople making you feel bad, but you don't have that annoying interruption to break your concentration every 10 minutes. Anything that you can get absorbed in is going to fight off depression. Because part of getting out of depression is getting out of your head. That's where the depression is. In getting into something that really absorbs and engages you. So a good program without advertisements, it's much like a good novel. And nobody would think that reading a novel is going to cause depression. That's where I think the best use of media is. Still, you'd want to limit it. Not because it's bad. I'm not saying that TV is bad for you. It's just that, you know, reading a novel um, 16 hours a day may not be the best way to live. You're going to be neglecting other things. So it boils down to that again. If while watching TV, you're neglecting other parts of your life, then you should reconsider. As I go through this, you're welcome to ask questions. Let me remind myself how we do that. How do we ask questions on this? How do we ask questions on this? On bottom right, on your desktop, 
that's on the bottom right of your desktop or on the phone there's a question mark you're welcome to shoot me a question and i'll answer as many as i can all right so why is it that getting absorbed is so good for your mood one reason is that we all have a tendency to ruminate this is that kind of negative thinking we get stuck in when we're having a bad day or our body's in physical pain or we've had a rough time at work or we have some major stress coming up we ruminate we dwell and brood and worry and overanalyze and we try to break that cycle if only i could stop thinking like this if only i could stop thinking about my divorce but that just reminded me of my divorce which i want to stop thinking about so how do i get out of this and how do i stop this pattern of thinking i think that all of us have been there at some point i certainly have and too much rumination causes depression so what we found is the best way to get out of rumination is anything that really absorbs you again gets you out of your head and a good netflix or amazon prime program is a great opportunity for that i'll shift into someone who makes a lot of these movies um steven spielberg and this is of course his jaws movie in a lot of his movies he has a dark beast or monster chasing after people some haunting thing that's going to get people but i call this one scary whispers because and let me see if i can load this up may not load this was a video where steven spielberg talked about what drove him to make movies and he said it quite simply that the the moment i stopped making films those scary whispers would come back into my head those negative depressive thoughts that i couldn't get out you wouldn't want to be around me when i wasn't making movies so mr spielberg had that intense kind of rumination and he was using filmmaking to fight it off in fact I, I would speculate that it worked so well for him that he just kept making films non-stop and we've seen that in his career he's made so many films and just keeps hacking away at it because if he stops doing it he gets that intense rumination and people who ruminate a lot also have a great gift that is they are great problem solvers and they are great creative thinkers well think about it when people ruminate they're often imagining the worst thing happening oh my god what if this coronavirus gets us all what if i never leave the house what if the economy tanks they're imagining a future a negative future but the same part of that brain can imagine a new world a different world and create that world imagine things that haven't happened yet and that kind of imagination talent is what makes great film and art and movies and songs and poetry so that's why a lot of artists and creative people are pretty intense ruminators and it's both a gift that allows them to be creative but in some ways it's also something that they're driven to get absorbed in painting or movie making to get out of that thought process. But we all have it on some level, and I think we all enjoy the good escape from it that a movie brings. We actually know where in the brain people ruminate from, and I've highlighted the parts of the brain there in red. It's called the default mode network. They call it the default mode because for years, doctors didn't know what it was doing so they just said it's like the default it's actually what gets activated when you're doing nothing and that's when we tend to ruminate we sit around doing nothing now we do a kind of therapy at our practice called behavioral activation and it's a therapy for depression that gets people very active helps them to stop avoiding things and start approaching new things in life that absorb them so here's a show just to show you how therapy or the way you live your life can change the brain this is a study of adolescents who underwent only five sessions of behavioral activation and you see to the left their brain is very red 
That's the default mode. Remember that right there, the big red part. Here the brain is flipped upside down the other way, but there it is. And as they go through the therapy, gradually that part of their brain settles down. So you see right there, both in their own, if you met these people, you'd see they were ruminating a lot less and much more engaged in life. So what helps depression is getting engaged and getting active, not avoiding things, getting absorbed in things, and variety. So the opposite of depression is variety. Depression wants you to do the same thing all the time. Don't take risks. Don't try something new. And that's part of the reason why simply watching Sopranos all day is not a good solution for depression. But watching it for an hour or two, perhaps as a reward after you've done difficult stuff like paying taxes or cleaning the kitchen, it's a great resource for the depressed mind. So in this therapy, we help people get in, find things that fully engage them. And that's different for everyone. You know, somebody playing basketball who's not an athlete might just feel terrible, tired, inept, like they're not good enough, bored. Other people playing basketball, that's gonna get them out of their head and they feel fully alive. Athletes call this in the zone. Psychologists call it flow or mindfulness. That's when you're fully present in the present moment and you're not worrying about the future or regretting the past or overanalyzing your life. You're just there, fully involved in what's happening right now, which might be the very engaging scene in that series on the screen or the very engaging conversation you're having through the Zoom video or Facebook. So these are a list of some things that most people find engaging. You might choose some for yourself. And when you get that ruminative mind, try one of these. Notice I put on there a page turner. That's a book that you can't pull, put down. You're so absorbed in it, you keep wanting to read it. And that could also be a good series on Netflix or Amazon. Engaging activity has these qualities in them. Time flies when you're doing it. You lose your sense of time, like time flies when you're having fun, and you're not self-conscious. One thing that the default mode does is it actually makes us self-conscious. It makes us think about who we are and what we're doing, and if we're doing the right thing, if we're doing good enough. Do people like us? That's the default mode, getting active or overactive. Of course, we can't just cut this thing out. Like it's it's necessary to have those thoughts from time to time, but we don't want it all the time. So wh when you're doing something engaging, you're not thinking about yourself. You're not thinking about how you feel even. You're not necessarily happy. If someone were to stop this woman while she's painting and you can see she's fully absorbed and say, how do you feel? She would probably say, I don't know, I'm painting. I'm trying to get the blue just right and trying to fix this line. Another quality of engaging activity is that it's challenging enough. It's not so difficult that it makes you feel stressed out and inept and overwhelmed, but it's not so easy that it's boring. So you want just that right level. It tends to involve the senses. So painting, cooking, gardening, knitting, athletic activity. These are things that you do with your hands or your whole body. They, that naturally gets you into the sensory world and helps you get into the present moment. Now, engaging activity doesn't have to have all of these qualities. I think if it just has one, that could be enough to be engaging. The next quality is that there's clear goals and quick feedback. Now, every time this woman paints on the canvas, she's gonna see what she did, so she gets instant feedback. And she knows what she's going for. If she doesn't know what she's going for, she might get overwhelmed and depressed after a while because she can never get there. So sensory things tend to give us quick feedback on what we're doing and keep us in the moment, in the zone, so our mind doesn't wander too far. 
they are slightly addictive, meaning the more you do them, the more you want to do them. They're fun, they're pleasurable, but they're not so addictive that you can't stop them and they control you rather than you controlling them. So video games could fit here. There's a great example of screen time, and we'll be talking next week about ways to help sharpen the brain, the memory and concentration. And I got news for you, video games are one of them. In fact, the FDA last year approved a prescription video game to treat ADHD. So I started thinking, how is that? I mean, we think of people with ADHD as being addicted to video games because they have trouble doing anything else, so they get hooked but a video game that treats ADHD. So I looked at it and it turns out to be not that different from Tetris or Mario Kart. It's just a boat going down the river and you gotta press the button at the right time and avoid these things. It's really nothing special. It's not different than most video games, except in one way. It automatically shuts off after 20 minutes of play and you can't turn it back on for the day. When the kids did it for ADHD, they wanted to turn it back on. They enjoyed it. So video games exercise our brain. They get us involved in a lot of the things I've listed here. We get fully absorbed in them. There's definitely quick feedback with the video game, and it's very sensory. It's dexterity. And just about any dexterity activity, whether it's darts or pool or video games, improves the brain and improves memory. Well, I've given you a hint of what we'll be talking about next time. But the point there was video games can be good for the brain when done in moderation. The next two have to do with the reason you're doing it. Things tend to be more engaging if you're doing it not for some kind of outcome, like to make friends or get more money, but just for the sake of doing it, for the love of the game. You care so much about baseball that you just want to play whether you win or lose. Or it's a higher cause, by which I mean a value that you care about. And it doesn't have to be a grand value. It could just be that you care about the health of your pets. Well, if you care about your pet's health, then you're going to be very engaged when you're taking care of them and feeding them and choosing the right food for them because it's something that absorbs you because you care about it. It turns out the last two are really important because another thing that fights depression is persistence. If you can persist in the face of adversity, of hardship, rejection, sadness, loss, anxiety, fear, fatigue, if you can persist in the face of all these things, you will have a very low chance of getting depressed. And the thing it turns out that makes us persist the most is when we're doing something for a higher cause. Those of you who've studied the civil rights movement might remember that song, keep your eyes on the prize, hold on, stay with it. And the people who were fighting in the civil rights movement were certainly going through every kind of thing that can cause depression. They were being shamed, humiliated, abused, kicked out in jail, injured, hurt, traumatized but they didn't have large rates of depression because they were doing it as a group, as a community for a higher cause, and they stuck with it. If you're interested in this kind of thinking, there's a great book called Finding Flow by a psychologist who, whose name I can never pronounce, but it's a quick read and it taught, hey, this person did a, a lot of research on what makes people happy and what are they doing when they're happy? And he found that doing things with these qualities created the most happiness. Now, by the way, in one intriguing study that his colleagues did, they found that people were happiest when they watched TV. And this baffled the psychologist. But what they finally figured out is that people in this study were using TV as a reward. So they felt happy because they were absorbed and relaxed after doing something difficult. That study also found that people were least happy when they were doing their cosmetics or showering in the morning, which might have to do with social comparison and the feelings we get when we don't like our body. 
And I'll wrap up with this. If you want a quick routine outside of the television that has a very curative effect on depression, it's simply walking in the woods. And I've been impressed with how many of my patients are doing that these days during the stay at home order. They are just going out and walking in nature for an hour a day. So this was a remarkable study where they took people and had them walk for 90 minutes, either in the suburbs or in the woods. And the ones who walked in the woods had much less depressive rumination at the end of it. Now, just how much I'll show you here. Um, on the left, you see the rumination has dropped significantly in those who walked in a natural setting in the woods compared to the urban setting. But what's also interesting about this study is they then put those people under a PET scan and took a picture of their brain. And that's what you see on the right, is there was also a major drop in the activity of their default mode network. So psychotherapy or being in nature can change the brain in ways that change depression. So why does walking in the woods help so much? Well, we don't really know. It might be that that's just what our brain is kind of used to over many thousands of years. We're used to being in nature, so it feels at home there, which would mean it feels less threatened, that there's actually not things coming at us in the woods that are stressing us, cars driving by us, people putting us down, people cutting us off, people being rude, people flaunting their wealth or their beauty more than what we have, making us feel bad about ourselves. There's not as many threats in the woods, unless, of course, you have a snake phobia. So walking around in that kind of peace, you can get fully absorbed. And when there's not a lot of threats around, you're not going to ruminate as much. There's many other reasons why it might help down to the fact that you actually have to move your toes a lot more when you're walking in the woods to get a steady ground than you would on pavement. And moving the toes like that engages the brain. And then there's just the constant changing beauty of the trees. They found that just having pictures, a mural of trees, helps the brain and helps people's physical and mental health. We do something at the practice called transcranial magnetic stimulation. It's a new treatment. It's a little magnet that activates the brain and treats depression about twice as good as an antidepressant. And we found that this treatment works better when people are engaged in more happy or active thinking. So we put a big mural of the forest in front of the machine to help people get better outcomes there. All right, if you're interested in these, this type of thinking, I have a new book out that details 30 ways to improve mood and sharpen the brain. I wrote it for people with depression, thinking, uh, looking through research, trying to find things that they could do in their own home because so many of my patients with depression are unable to leave their home. Well, now we're all in those shoes and we're all stuck at home. So these are 30 things you can do at home that improve mood. And I hope you'll join us next week where we'll talk about ways to work effectively from home and improve your concentration. That'll be Friday at 1230. I'll pause and take some questions. How does anxiety contribute to depression? This person says that if they get upset, they get depressed a few days later. And that's very true. Anxiety contributes in two ways. One is that it causes avoidance. And avoidance is one of the strongest causes of depression. When you fear things or worry about things, you tend to avoid them. And when you just having an anxious mind will make you less able to think creatively and solve problems. So the key to living with anxiety is to decrease avoidance. Think about what you're avoiding, what you're shying away from, and take that on. A lot of our therapists have a sign on their door that says, live outside your comfort zone. 
And that's what therapy for anxiety is often doing, is helping people gradually overcome that anxiety and stop the avoidance. The other reason that anxiety causes depression is just what I talked about with rumination. Rumination is a specific type of anxiety when you get in an endless chain of thought, of negative thinking. Rumination is like your brain thinks it's solving a problem, but it's not. It's never going to get there. And the brain won't stop because it just keeps thinking, I'm almost there, I've almost solved the problem. It's like your teenager who's on the computer trying to finish something, and you say, come down for dinner. And they say, oh, just a minute, mom, I'm just almost done with this. And you know it's going to be another hour before you can get them down because they're not almost done with it. they got a ways to go. So in rumination, we're trying to solve a problem. Like the problem might be, do people really like me? Well, that's a question that I'll never answer because even if they tell me they like me, I might think, are they being honest? So it's like an endless rabbit hole that you can't get out of. And that's a big cause of depression. The next question, do you see any negatives to time spent on Zoom and FaceTime to connect to others? Personally, I don't. Um, I think it's a wonderful thing. Do more of it and get connected. Connection of any sort helps depression. And in this modern world, we can kind of fool the brain. Clearly, there's nobody in the room with you when the Zoom is on, but you feel like they are, and they are virtually. And I'll share with you some studies that bear that out. They found that if you're sitting with your pet, say your dog, the same parts of your brain activate as they would if you're sitting with your best friend. So your brain doesn't know the difference. And likewise, if you're talking to your best friend through Zoom, most of the same parts of the brain will activate. I mentioned already that filling the room with fake plants or pictures of plants is going to help the mind almost as much as being in nature. Right? Not quite the same, but almost as much. Question three. Maybe the oxygen in the woods is easier to breathe. Oh my gosh, you... You sound like you've read my book. Thank you. So there is a lot of research on what we call negative air ions. And this is, I'll just segue into this because it's a fascinating story. We use light box or light therapy to treat depression. It's very effective. But for a while, they started testing it against a placebo. They always have to use a placebo. So people thought that these negative ion generators, they're like air purifiers that create this pleasant smell. Well, people thought those would be helpful, like our person who asked this question thinks. So they used it as a placebo. It turned out the joke was on the scientist because these negative air ionizers treated depression just as well as the light box. And then they studied them on their own and found that indeed they did. So people can use these. They're like $100. Um, they're little devices. I talk about them in the book and they create a very pleasant, if you think of like a waterfall smell, it's um, the negative oxygen ions that lead to a better mood. And those are prevalent in the forest. They're not as prevalent indoors because our HVAC units suck them out. But they are pre prevalent, particularly in a rainy, after a rainy day when the sun is breaking up the oxygen ions and the water is evaporating near a waterfall, near the beach with the ocean tides cracking, anytime it's splitting those um, water molecules into negative ions, they're pretty prevalent. So a rainforest would be the ideal in that respect. They've also found that plants emit phytochemicals that are good for the immune system and probably good for the mind. What is the opposite of rumination? Um, we should do a whole webinar on this. This is, I think, one of the number one things that people who come to see us suffer from. So the opposite of rumination is being fully in the moment. The types of qualities I listed for an engaging activity where you're not aware. You know, you know they say every dog has its day because dogs, we think, are less worried about the future and less self-conscious. 
So that's a great feeling. And I think we all think about a time when we were really happy, like maybe we were part of a group we really felt a part of. So we we're outside of our head. We were doing something we really cared about. That would be the opposite of rumination. You were in flow. You were in the zone. Mindfulness is one. But there's another way to look at that question, which is when is rumination helpful? I said we can't cut this out. I mean, that's not the solution. It turns out that rumination can be very effective. And the difference is, where is it getting you? If you're thinking all day about a problem and it's getting you nowhere, it's not leading toward action or decision, then it's unhelpful rumination. But if you're ruminating and thinking too much and it's actually getting you somewhere, then it's helpful rumination. And that's good, that's productive problem solving. So in a way, rumination is just problem solving gone awry. Abraham Lincoln, this man had chronic depression, by which I mean literally, Mr. Lincoln was on suicide watch by his friends. They kept him 24 seven. They thought he was gonna kill himself when he was 32. He went to psychiatrists to get treatment, which involved leeches and bloodletting. Probably didn't help him, but he figured out how to help depression on his own. Because Mr. Lincoln was a ruminator. Well, he found a problem bigger than himself. That was slavery and the Civil War. Those will get you out of your head. And think about it. We probably want a ruminator in chief when we're at the Civil War because we want someone who's going to think carefully about every decision and really look at all sides of it. So Lincoln had an expression that he said to his colleagues in the White House. I walk slowly, but I never walk backwards. Which means I ruminate all the time and consider everything, but I'm getting somewhere. I know I'm getting toward a decision or a plan or an action. And that means that Mr. Lincoln discovered how to ruminate effectively. He was getting somewhere. Next question, does it help to mute when there is fearful action and drama? Yes, definitely mute, but even more important is the visual. The brain is so impacted by visual stuff. Hearing about someone dying is gonna be way less traumatic than seeing someone dying. Um, now, I read this kind of research all the time, so I, I try to apply it to my life. And when I go to the movies like The Hunger Games, I was putting my head down to the floor for half of that movie because the images were so disturbing. Next question. Often I feel too depressed to motivate and get out of my mind. Any tips? That's a tough one. I've listed things that can help depression if you do them, but to really help you with that question, I want someone to see you for therapy to help you find a place to start. Because getting out of depression and improving your mood is not about doing everything perfectly. I mean, a lot of it, like I said, is about doing less avoidance, avoiding things less, so you're not staying in bed all day and avoiding the conflicts with your family. But you don't have to be perfect here. Like we all avoid sometimes. We all have a rough day and avoid and hide away and stew and ruminate. It's really a matter of frequency and how long it goes on for. So on that note, I will mention that it's probably totally okay to binge watch a lot of junk on the holidays like we all do. I know I went through about two series over Thanksgiving because that's not a habit. You're just doing it for a brief time. What we're talking about here when we talk about health and mood and depression is habits. So if these things I've said that cause depression become habitual, then you might find yourself in depression. If you just do it for a day or two, no big deal. Likewise, to answer your question, if you can build habits that become consistent, that's the key word. So doing a little bit every day, finding one of those activities I listed and doing it starting with 30 or 60 minutes a day, then that can help you get out of depression and you can build from there. Your brain doesn't care 
if you climb a mountain or clean out your closet. See, the brain is not that smart. It just gets excited. You know, it's like, wow, I did something and the dopamine fires up. It's not like that much more dopamine fires up because you climbed a mountain. And that's why money doesn't bring happiness because the brain can't really tell the difference between $75,000 and $800,000. And we know that because consistently research finds that happiness peaks at around $75,000 a year for a single person. Once you get beyond that, happiness goes down a little bit. It doesn't peak. So that's just all to share with you that um, you don't have to do anything grand to get out of depression, but you do have to do it consistently. And if you can't do anything, then find a therapist who can help you get started with something. Our next question, I recently started therapy again and it helps. How much should we see a therapist if cost is not the issue? That's a great question. You should see a therapist about weekly as ideal. Sometimes people go more than that, but usually not. So weekly would be the ideal. And then in terms of how long you should see a therapist, that would be as long as you need to keep up the new habits you've built. So whatever it is you're working on in therapy to change, whether it's an addiction, a relationship problem, or an anxious or depressive habit you've, you've gotten into, you could start to taper down on the frequency to every two weeks and then every four weeks and see if you keep up your gains. If you start to slip, then raise the frequency again. And usually in therapy, it takes about four to six weeks, weeks of weekly therapy to start to see improvement. Next question, I'm avoiding cleaning my house and I used to be away from the house 10 or more hours a day. Any suggestions? Wow, that that is a tough one. Um, I think getting creative with it may be the solution here. You may be locked into a way of thinking about it that it just builds and builds and the more you avoid it, the more negative it gets. So don't think of it as cleaning your house. Think of it as dancing to your favorite tune that you put on while you have the sweeper with you. So my guess there is that when you start to think about cleaning or start to clean, that your mind might be filled with more negative thoughts. I don't know what they are, but they might be, why didn't I do this? Why have I put this off so long? How did I let it get this dirty? This is gonna take forever. I'm never gonna get done with this. It's never good enough. Why can't I be working again and going to work? Why am I stuck here? All these types of negative thoughts. So if you find you're avoiding something for that reason, you might actually be avoiding the way you feel inside or think inside when you're doing it. And we call that internal avoidance. So think about that for all of you who've asked questions about how you're not able to do something, think about what you're avoiding on the inside, which may be thoughts or feelings that come up when you do it. And find a way to do it, which might mean putting on music, something to change your context and your way of thinking that you don't have that experience. In therapy, we found, by the way, that the best thing to help people persevere and persist, like I said, this is all about persistence, doing something you don't wanna do, is when you do it for a greater cause. So if you who've asked about cleaning the house can get in touch with a greater cause, something you really care about, that's connected to the cleaning, it might be your family or it might be your friends because now your friends can come over after all this shutdown. Um, it might be aesthetics. If you care about beauty, then you're making your house more beautiful. These are all worthy causes and they can all motivate you to do something that you otherwise really don't want to do because really the answer to your question is who would want to clean their house? It's miserable work. Why do any of us do it? We do it for a greater cause or we do it because we have the music on and we forget ourselves. The final question is, can past trauma create pathways in the brain? Can these practices make new brain paths? Definitely past trauma does create pathways in the brain. Whether it's trauma you may have witnessed at work as a healthcare provider, trauma in your early life, trauma in your adult life, 
whether it's something that happened to you or something you saw in someone else. Trauma means an extreme state that activates your anxiety to a high level. So it tends to be things that involve extreme danger, like threats of violence to yourself, threats of your bodily integrity, which includes rape as a trauma because it's the sanctity of your body and threats to your life or to someone else, threats of major injury. So car accidents. Um, bullying is different from trauma. I want to mention bullying is another big cause of mental health problems that also happens in the workplace and that we treat a lot of. But bullying is not exactly the same as trauma. Bullying affects the brain in different ways, but still has a profound depressive effect and changes those brain paths. So yes, that was the point of that slide with the ruminating mind and how getting active and engaging activity can change that. And we do therapies that change the brain for people who've been through trauma, like eye movement desensitization, brain spotting, and cognitive behavioral therapy. And we do see definite changes in the brain after that. Thank you, everyone. And I hope to join with you next week.